Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Benjamin Baird and I'll be your host today as we continue our webinar series with the Middle East Forum Projects. I am the Deputy Director of Islamist Watch Project and I'm joined today by a very special guest, Yasmin Mohammed. Yasmin is a university instructor, human rights activist and book author. Her organization, Free Hearts, Free Minds, supports closeted ex-Muslims from Muslim majority countries and organizes an online campaign called No Hijab Day to oppose World Hijab Day. She is the author of an autobiography and memoir, Unveiled, How Western Liberals Empower Radical Islam. Yasmin, first, thank you for being here with us today. Um, I wanna start with your story, which is really a very uh, harrowing experience of growing up in an Islamist household and and being pushed into a marriage with, with an actual jihadist. Uh, but it wasn't always like that for you. For a few years anyway, you were, were raised in what many would consider uh, a normal Western household. Tell us about your early childhood and what changed to bring fundamentalist Islamist beliefs into your life. Well, like you said, um, it, my early childhood was, you know, from what I remember, it's very early. I was about five or six years old when things took a turn for the worst. Um, I played with my non-Muslim friend neighbors. That was the thing that I remember more than anything is that they had their Barbies and I had my Barbies and we had like these little plastic Barbie cases. And I lived in an apartment building. So I would just walk down the hall to their house or their apartment and they walked to mine. Um, so I had my two best friends, Chelsea and Lindsay. And um, there were, I would attend birthday parties. I don't remember any of my own birthday parties, but I remember looking forward to having a birthday party one day. Um, I rode a bike, I had a little tricycle, um, went swimming played in the playground with all the neighborhood kids, you know, just to, like you've said, a normal upbringing. Mm -hmm. And then when I was between five and six years old, my mom, so my parents split when I was basically, when she was pregnant with me. Mm -hmm. So I have no memory of, of living with my dad. And when I was about five or six years old, my mom, remarried she became the second wife the second concurrent wife to uh an egyptian man who already had a wife so his first wife was a french canadian convert and then there was my mom who was wife number two and we all lived we left our apartment that we lived in eventually um and moved in and lived with him where the you know wife number one was upstairs the kids, number one, the preferred family, mm. uh, the primaries were upstairs and us as the secondary family were, were downstairs in the, in the unfinished basement. And um, yeah, so that was the, the big sort of bomb that was dropped on my childhood that, that changed everything. Sure. So uh, how did your mother get drawn into this relationship? Um, I've heard you mention elsewhere that um, after sort of struggling financially as a single mother, um, that she was drawn to, to the mosque. Uh, and that's how she was sort of uh, brought to this relationship. Um, do you think that's normal for, for uh, Muslim single women to be um, sort of... Uh, brought into the mosque community um, and then uh, indoctrinated into an Islamist lifestyle? Um, so first off, it wasn't a financial pressure that made her go to the mosque. It was more looking for a community support because her dad or <laughs> my dad um, and her were living in San Francisco when they had my sister and they had just moved to Canada. So she didn't really have a huge support system in Canada. I see. Um, yeah. And so she was looking for community and support in that way when she went to the mosque and her being of Egyptian descent and of Muslim background, even though she grew up in a pretty secular home, um, it was just the place that she gravitated towards. 
Now, with your second question about is it is it typical for um, single women, Muslim, I guess, single mothers, especially, mm -hmm. um, my answer to that is that if you look at cults in general, single mothers are, um, you know, one of the main people that end up becoming that, that end up getting pulled into those systems because uh, they are looking for that. They're looking for community. They're looking for support. They're looking for, um, you know, tight bonds, especially somebody like my mom who didn't have her family in, in Canada. She didn't have anybody to lean on. And so when you become part of a tight knit cult, it's, it feels comforting. It feels supportive. It feels like everybody is, is taking care of each other. Um, and so I have seen that time and time and time again. And I've spoken to so many people. In fact, I have a, a show similar to this one called Forgotten Feminists. And my next guest is a woman named Deb who um, her mother joined a cult when she was 12 years old and similar idea. She was a single mom looking for a support system. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily specifically Muslim single mothers, but it's it's definitely a, a phenomenon. Sure. Um, so things changed after uh, your mother uh, married uh, her second marriage, um, but you had a bit of a rebellious streak, I understand, for, for at least a few years. Um, tell us about how you challenged your Islamist upbringing and also, uh, when did you stop questioning your mother uh, in the Islamic faith and give in to this new lifestyle? Yeah, those are all really good questions. Um, it's obviously easier looking back, you know. Um, but in the moment, I mean, you can just imagine, here I am, this five or six-year-old girl, excited about my next birthday party and what theme I'm going to have. And will it be at McDonald's? Because that was the big deal back in those days. Mm -hmm. um, and then to be told, birthdays are haram. You're not going to get a birthday. It's forbidden. And then to be told, you're not allowed to play with your friends anymore. You can't play with Chelsea and Lindsay. They're non-Muslims. They can't be your friends. And then to have your Barbies disappear. And then to not be allowed to ride a bike anymore, to not be allowed to go swimming anymore, to not be allowed to play with the neighborhood friend, kids anymore. Like it was just like this slow, not even that slow. It was actually quite a quick progression of one thing after another that is devastating to a kid, you know? And so of course I hated it. I hated this man that came into our lives and made my mom put this ugly thing on her head and was breaking her records. I mean, that was one of the moments that was most jarring for me, sitting on the carpet, watching this man take my mom's records. She used to love country music. She had like Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers and Hank Williams, and it was playing in the house all the time. And I remember that record player because it was so cool. I'm like, how is the sound coming out of this plastic grooves? Um, and this guy, this person just enters our home and shes he just takes her records and he starts breaking them and mm. he's handing them to us and he's saying, break these because these are haram. This is, uh, this is from the devil. And my mom is just letting him. She's just letting him break her stuff. And, you know, I have an older brother and I can just imagine if he walked into my room and started breaking my stuff, like I would be losing it. And so the fact that she was just standing there looking down at the carpet, letting this happen, um, you know, that really, that was really jarring for me as a kid to watch that happen. I was, I was just in complete shock. Mm. Um, and of course he handed the records to us for us to break and I refused. Um, and I mostly refused because I felt bad for my mom. I'm like, I'm not going to break her stuff. And, uh, my brother and my sister happily broke the records because they were told to. And I think that was maybe a little bit of a foreshadowing for days to come, but yeah, I didn't really realize that I had a rebellious streak. I was certainly very unhappy 
I was certainly very angry. Um, I don't know if I even had the courage to be rebellious other than in my own head. Right. Um, but when you asked me, when did you give up? When did you finally give in? Um, I think it was just, it was just compounded, you know, one thing after another, one thing after another, and the physical abuse really, um, you know, it, it, it serves its purpose. It, it, it makes a kid not do what they're not supposed to do or to do what they're supposed to do because you're gonna be, you know, tied to the bed and whipped. Mm. And um, so it was, it was more like there was, I had nothing to fight with is what it was. Mm. Um, I was a kid. And they were adults and they were physically stronger than me. They had all the control over me. And so it was like futile. I don't think it didn't even cross my mind to fight. Uh, it, all I did was I just internalized a lot of anger and um, yeah, resentment. Mm -hmm. And I was too afraid to act on it. Did you have any Islamist schooling or did you attend? Yeah, any? yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. So at that at that time when he came and ruined our lives, um, we started going to an Islamic school. It wasn't a school, it was a mosque. And oh. in the mosque, they have like this event room. And in that event room, they just turned it into a makeshift school. And parents that had any kind of interest in any subject matter just came and became our teachers so it was a it was a sham um and my mom became the arabic school teacher because of course she speaks arabic fluently mm -hmm. um and then she started going to al Azhar university which is a prominent islamist university in uh egypt and so she became the or sorry islamic university in egypt mm -hmm. and she became the uh head of the islamic studies department um so as her daughter there was or all of us there was pressure on us to be top of the class when it came to arabic or when it came to islamic studies because of course it's going to reflect on her um but zero value for any of the other subjects let me tell you like nothing we got no, science, no, no benefit man. Okay. absolute garbage education um science was backwards they'd read the quran first and this is what the quran says and so then they would go and try to find something to support what's already in the quran and of course the quran is full of scientific not just fallacies but absolute nonsense you know sperm comes from the backbone <laughs> like just the most ludicrous things um and that was my Islamic studies or my Islamic school schooling. Um, and of course, with it being in the mosque, you can imagine every single you're stopped. You know, it's, you pray five times a day. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in the mosque, if you're supposed to be in school for a certain amount of time. You know, most of the day is taken up stopping and going for prayers because in a mosque, a prayer is a big thing. It's not just something you go and do for a few minutes and come back. And so there'd be those sermons every Friday that went on for like hours, you know, where he's just yelling about killing infidels and Jews. And this was my normal life. Um, but I made lots of good friends in the school in those years who were just as miserable as I was. Hmm. Um, and, you know, we would all sort of huddle together and try to support each other as best we could. I mean, we're little kids. We're like grade five, six, you know, what can we do? But we can, um, we did little rebellious things like, you know, a, a, in Islam, when a girl gets her period, she's impure. So she's not allowed to enter the mosque. She's not allowed to pray. She's not allowed to touch the Quran. Right. So of course we would all be like, you know, pretending we have our period like uh. for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd be like you know secretly putting on eyeliner and mm. um things like that like we sort of supported each other in our little bit of rebelliousness so 
So that was the, the good part of those years. But other than that, um, yeah, just atrocious education. Um, and uh, yeah, and atrocious everything else. So you must have been somewhat behind the curve then by the time you did experience a secular Western education. Um, yeah, so this is why I'm resentful because it was so yeah. difficult for me to catch up, especially, I mean, I didn't, there were basic things that I didn't know. You know, I didn't know anything about Canadian geography. Like I'm born and raised in Canada and I did not know anything about the geography of my country. Mm. Um, math, forget math, because it's scaffolded, right? You So all of a sudden I go into grade eight where they're doing algebra and I'm like, I don't even know long division. Mm. Um, I, what am I gonna, like everything, every every subject you can think of. I was starting from scratch when I went, when I started going to, so what happened was the Muslim school at the time, the Islamic school didn't have a secondary school, didn't have a high school. Okay. And so that's why I was allowed to go to a secular public school at the time. Um, it was very, very difficult academically, but I made lots of friends and I loved, you know, meeting new people and um eventually I got taken out of school again grade nine did not was non-existent for me mm. because my mom was so angry at me for um a for having non-muslim friends and b because I told one of my teachers about all the abuse at home and he oh. alerted the authorities yeah that's Mr. Fabro he wrote the foreword to my book um, and so keeping me home again was a way of keeping me away from the, the non-Muslims and anybody who could, uh, tarnish my mind with evil ideas of, you know, equality and liberty, and also from keeping me away from anyone who could help me. Right. And Canadian authorities ultimately weren't very helpful to you, were they? That's correct. So it went through, um... Yeah, so social services, like child protective services, police were involved. It was this massive investigation. It went on forever. I remember Mr. Fabro telling me, like, there's going to come a point where you're going to be sitting in a courtroom and you're going to have to, you know, give your testimony, tell the judge about everything. And are you prepared to do that? And I was, I was very prepared to do that. I used to you know, Murder, She Wrote and Matlock were big in those days. And I used to watch those shows and think like, yeah, that's going to be me, like the, doing the whole Perry Mason thing. That's him, your honor. And um, I really psyched myself up. Like, I was like, I'm ready for this. I'm going to tell on him. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell everything. Um, but there are five of us. So he had two kids upstairs and then there's three of us downstairs. Right. And so the investigators talked to everybody. Mm -hmm. And even though his daughter had a handprint on her face when she went to school one day, and so he already had that in his record. Uh, so when I went and, and told on him, that was strike two. Mm. Um, but still, after the investigation, I'm not sure if it was the investigation. I'm not sure if it was just the judge making his judgment or what it was. But at the end of the day, it was the judge who said he's the one who made the judgment that this is your culture. This is your family. This is how they choose to discipline you. Um, there's nothing we can do to help you. Good luck. Hmm. And After I've heard all that. that Right. And I've heard that in other cases as well. And whether it be, uh, you know, debating the merits of Sharia and, and uh, divorces in Muslim families, um, or as you say, uh, physical abuse of, of children, um, that the courts can eventually just rule, in fact, that uh, this is just part of your culture, um, which goes basically against the foundations of a secular democracy in many ways, right? Um, Absolutely. That is the case, and and especially in Canada, I've heard uh, numerous cases uh, result in that. Is that true? 
Absolutely true. And I got so many messages from people who worked in social services in different areas um, who would send me letters, basically, you know, apologizing, like almost like a remorseful messages saying, I read your book and I did that. I was one of those people. I had to do that. That was our job. You don't understand. This is how it has to be. Um, that's the way they treat the, you know, Aboriginals in our country and in Australia. I've got messages from Australians as well. Um, and in the UK, you know, all over the world, it's the same story where they feel like they need to, it's cultural relativism is what it is, is they feel like the upholding, you know, a culture that abuses children and that treats girls as lesser than is more important than protecting the actual children in these scenarios. Sure. And um, yeah, I mean, at the time, this is, this is the most tragic thing is when you are a Muslim, you grow up with a very, very, very fiercely strong us and them mentality, right? The non-Muslims hate you. They want you dead. They don't, you know, they're at war with you. They smile at you. They pretend they like you, but they hate you. Um, the only people you can trust are Muslims. We're, we're here to support each other, all that stuff. You know, very sort of mafia cultish. And so when the judge said to me, sorry, I'm not gonna help you because of the accident of birth, because your family happens to have come from Egypt. Um, if, a, if you were a kid sitting in front of me whose family came from Germany or France or the UK, then I'd protect you. But sorry, you're the wrong skin color, you're the wrong ethnicity, um, so go home and endure. What that told me was two things. First of all, they were right. These non-Muslims do hate me. They do want me to live in misery. Here I was thinking that it was all a lie and that non-Muslims were actually just normal people. Um, and that if I reached out to them for help, that I would get the help. So when I was told, we're not actually gonna help you, that confirmed that. And because it was like, we're not gonna help you because you're Muslim. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the second thing that it did was it, um, sorry, I completely forgot. I get really emotional talking about this and I no, lost my train of thought. I completely understand. Um, yeah, so it, it just, it, it validated the us and them sure. in a really, oh, and this is the second thing. The second thing is it also validated that Allah is more powerful and what Allah mm -hmm. wants is what's going to happen. And you can go to the police, you can go to the court system, you can go wherever you want, but you will remain controlled because that's what Allah wants. Mm -hmm. And so it was so insidious. It was um, such a dark time of my life because that I gave up hope. Right. Right. Um, I do want to fast forward a little bit to another um traumatic part of your life um it, you uh were pushed into a marriage pressured into a marriage um with an islamist who uh ended up being a member or well, supporter a terrorist yeah terrorist. yes absolutely um tell us about this last phase of living under these oppressive uh islamist rules um and what ultimately changed to liberate you from these uh, circumstances? I think that's what I draw out of your story as inspiration is what eventually got you out of this. Um, and I think that's a message that should resonate with people um, experiencing similar circumstances to your own. Well, for me, it was definitely my daughter. So um, I had a daughter with him and holding this precious, beautiful little baby girl that I'd just given birth to and feeling like so much love for her, a love that I'd never felt before. I love, I didn't even know I was capable of loving another human being that much. 
and also feeling this overwhelming um, need to protect her and feeling um, you know, devastated if I were to allow her to live this life that I've hated, you know, and here I am bringing her into this world to live this same life. And I didn't want that for her. And in fact, it would have been even worse because of who her father is. And um, so one of the first moments was when she was just a baby and he leaned over and he's like, when are we gonna, when are we gonna get her cleaned? And I was like, what are you talking about? She just had a bath. He's like, no, well, like, when are we gonna get her fixed? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean get her fixed? And then my mom says, oh no, 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 we're, don't worry about that. We're gonna do that when she's like five or six years old, we'll go to Egypt and we'll get that done. And that's when I understood they were talking about FGM. Mm. So close to 90% of girls in Egypt have had this done to them. Um, it's not in my family, luckily. Um, mm. And that has a lot to do with the fact that, my, like I mentioned earlier on in this conversation, my mom came from a very secular upbringing. Right. Um, but it's incredibly common in Egypt. And so that's how she knew what he was talking about. And when my mom said, yeah, we're going to take her to get this done. I just felt so betrayed by her once again. Um, but, but this time it was so much worse because she wasn't betraying me. She was betraying my daughter. Like it's my responsibility to protect her. And this woman is coming in here and saying that she's going to be complicit in helping this man to get my daughter's genitals mutilated with razor blades. Like, mm -hmm. so in that moment, I just felt like I will do anything that it takes to make sure that my daughter is out of this house before she reaches that age. That was like my, my goal at that time. Um, and I didn't get out fast enough, um, but I did eventually get out and it was certainly because of her for sure. Sure. Um, so living through your experience, uh, your years of trauma and the fear that your daughter could be forced to uh, endure the same conditions as you, um, you found a way to give back today um, and help others who might want to escape a lifetime of oppression. I'm talking about your nonprofit, of course, Free Hearts, Free Minds. Tell us about the work you do in helping ex-Muslims around the world. Well, I'm very proud to have this organization. I'm very proud to be working with the amazing people that I'm working with. I've got three um, wonderful group session facilitators, Aisha, Jessica, and Joanna. And what we're able to do is we're able to offer community and support and psychosocial tools to people who are living in the most dire circumstances they're one of the most vulnerable groups in the world so imagine being under fear of persecution or even execution because of your beliefs so these are people who have denounced islam but like you said earlier they can't say that publicly and so living the double life like having to hide who you are um, i did that for a few years and it is soul rotting it is a very difficult thing to do to be something else on the outside than you are on the inside um and so we have eight sessions that we go through and by the end of it they not only have tools to help them as individuals but they also have a support system because they've gone through this whole journey with a group of people and so they'll never feel alone again one of the most difficult things of leaving Islam, obviously there's many, but one of the, the most difficult parts of religious trauma is feeling so disconnected and in fact, quite often being disowned, um, or in my case, even threatened with death, which as I'm sure you've heard of honor killings and honor violence, um, because you're not willing to come, you know, get in line and, and comply with the rules. 
So they lose that community. They lose their friends. They lose their family. And so Free Hearts, Free Minds offers it back to them. That's great. Um, you're also involved with another uh, nonprofit. It's a new initiative uh, called the Clarity uh, Coalition. And that stands for Champions for Liberty Against the Reality of Islamist Tyranny. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Sure. So that, as you said, is a newly formed group I'm very excited about. We've got our first conference coming up in October where we're all going to get together. Um, what it is, it's a coalition of everybody who is concerned about Islamist tyranny. So whether you're Muslim, ex-Muslim, you know, atheist, Christian, Jewish, doesn't matter. Um, we're all people that are for liberty, for enlightenment values. Um, and against all of the tyrannical Islamist ideas, especially in, if you look at places like America and, and Europe, where those Islamist ideas are being sold as Muslim, you know, cultural things. So mm -hmm. we'll talk about the hijab, for example, they say, oh, it's just cultural. It's just, the, it's just cultural clothing. Well, which culture are we talking about here? Because women in Somalia and Egypt and Indonesia, all over the world from completely different cultures with completely different languages, completely different foods, they all wear the hijab. It has nothing to do with culture, it has everything to do with religion. These women are forced into this from childhood under threat of imprisonment in countries like Iran. Um, there's so much history in, in countries like Algeria where women have been killed and attacked with acid. Obviously, we all know what's happening in Afghanistan today. You know, women being forced into burqa, not being allowed out of their homes, girls not being allowed to go to school. All of this is happening right in front of their eyes. And they have the audacity to say, oh, it's just cultural. And mm -hmm. then to put the hijab all over um, advertisements and media and everything, which is literally triggering to women who have escaped those societies. They've escaped those tyrannical places and they've come here and they feel like they're fighting on their own. And so what Clarity is, is it's a coalition of all of us, instead of working on our own and feeling tired and feeling demoralized and, um, you know, when we're able to all support each other and come together as a group, then, you know, together we're stronger. And with one unified voice speaking up against the Islamists in media, in policy, then we can finally show the you know, clarify the truth and expose their lies. Right. It sounds like a really great initiative. Uh, we're a little bit over time, but I do want to ask one final question. Um, uh, if, if you could just bear with me a few minutes here. Speaking of the uh, challenges that ex-Muslims are facing, uh, recently in the news, you've heard about the attack on Salman Rushdie. Um, he was speaking at a New York-based institute when he was stabbed several times. He's currently in the hospital. Um, the man who stabbed him um, uh, was appears to be an Iranian, an Islamist sympathizer. Um, that's another challenge, I think, that ex-Muslims face, not only, of course, from Islamists, uh, but from state institutions around the world, from countries like Iran, um, which... Uh, threaten and, uh, you know, put out a hit against uh, Salman Rushdie in this case. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that challenge that ex-Muslims face as well? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I mean, my organization supports ex-Muslims living in Muslim majority countries because obviously it's, you know, it's more difficult there because you're surrounded by people who will hate you and want you killed, if not just like in places like Pakistan, Bangladesh, ex-Muslims have been hacked to death in the streets, beaten up by their schoolmates in university. Like it's it's incredibly dangerous. Right. Um, you'd think that being in the West, the theory is that being in the West, we are freer to speak out. And that's why a lot of us feel compelled as Ayan Hirsi Ali says it, um, she says, I, I'm not doing this because I enjoy it. It's I'm compelled to do this. I have a responsibility to do this. I'm in the United States of America. I'm in the freest country in the world. How could I not um, speak about all of the devastation that I know 
is, is happening in the world that I just was able to survive, miraculously able to survive. Um, and of course, situations like what happened to Ayan, like what happened to Theo Van Gogh, like what happened to the journalists and Charlie Hebdo, like what happened to Salman Rushdie that you just mentioned, like what happened to Samuel Pitti. I could go on and on and on and on. Um, so obviously we're not free in the West either. Um, and I cannot tell you how full my inboxes have been um, with messages from people, especially women, that are feeling very vulnerable right now. Um, people talking about going and getting a gun license, getting their first gun, going to uh, the gun range, learning how to fire a gun, people getting Rottweilers, like all sorts of different uh, responses to this. And to each of them, I've been sharing a quote actually from, um, from Salman Rushdie where he said once that terrorism is the art of fear. So the only way you can defeat it is by deciding not to be afraid. And I know that sounds, it can sound simplistic, but when it's coming from Salman Rushdie, you realize, well, if he can choose not to be afraid, then we can choose not to be afraid. When he has like a $3 billion bounty on his head right. um, and he's still out there publicly speaking, then, you know, those of us who are, you know, don't have platforms nearly as large, do not have those kinds of millions of dollars on our head. If he can do it, we can do it. And uh, it really is mind over matter. And to be honest with you, more than anything, I will not let them have any more control over my mind, over my body, over my actions. I lived the majority of my life seeped in fear, absolutely immersed in fear. I was too afraid to even have thoughts because Allah can read my mind and that I would be punished for even having thoughts. Mm. And they are not going to get not one inch of my mind ever again. I will not be afraid. I absolutely refuse to feel fear because I won't let them win. They will not get my body ever again or my mind ever again. And that's what it boils down to for me. And, you know, hopefully that that resonates with any ex Muslims that are watching this right now. Sure. And I think that's a very fitting and inspiring way to end our discussion today. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Yasmin, how can people get a hold of you who wanted to touch base? You mentioned that you, you have an inbox full of people responding to Salman Rushdie. How can people contact you? Yeah, so if you go to my website, yazwamohammed.com, there's a contact link there. Um, and then you can also follow me on Twitter, Muhammad, and I'm also on Facebook and on Instagram, and then on YouTube with Forgotten Feminists. Great. Thank you, Yasmin Muhammad, for being with us today. Thank you for our viewers for tuning in. You can stay subscribed to our future webinars, our project director webinars on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, that's about all we have. Stay subscribed to uh, uh, Middle East Foreign and IslamistWatch.org. Thank you.